Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Douglas E. French. Doug uh, comes from Kansas, and went, went to Washburn University there where he played uh, defensive tackle. Uh, he told me that the founder of his university was Ichabod Washburn and that frequently the opposing uh, players would taunt him about what was an Ichabod, so maybe he'll discuss that today, I don't know. Um, he uh, was a banker. Um, when uh, Ron Paul found out that he'd come to work at the Institute as our new executive vice president, he said, there goes the last honest banker. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're glad, very glad to have him here. And uh, for us, his greatest qualification beyond all his uh, fantastic business and financial and football experience, uh, is the fact that he got his master's in economics under Murray Rothbard at UNLV. And I can still remember the day that Murray called me and said, Lou, I've got this great new student. He's a banker. <laughs> so, and he was talking about Doug French. And uh, so Doug, appropriately enough, uh, today is going to be talking to us about uh, bubbles uh, of the past and the present and paper bubbles. Um, and of the sort of thing he learned from Murray Rothbard. So, Mr. Doug French. Thank you, Lou. Hey, y'all. <laughs> I've been working on that for about a month. Just try to get the lingo down here for, for Auburn. I know we've all been kind of sequestered here in this great... Uh, conference, and you probably don't keep up on bank failures, but I have this sort of morbid curiosity <laughs> about it, and uh, bank number 17 was seized yesterday in Florida, um, and interestingly enough, it was a bank called Freedom Bank. <laughs> uh, uh, it works out wonderfully for this, uh, for this speech. Uh, but Freedom Bank uh, probably did not have any gold deposits, probably practiced fractionalized uh, uh, money, of course, and paper money. They were a bank of only $287 million. So that's a relatively small bank. What's interesting per the FDIC uh, release on this is that the FDIC is going to be responsible from 80 to $104 million is going to be the loss that the, uh, the FDIC takes on this. And when you start doing the math that the FDIC only has $48 billion, and when they were insuring deposits up to 100000 they were insuring $5 trillion. Now at two fifty, presumably, they're insuring 9 or $10 trillion, and if they're going to lose $100,000, million dollars with the failure of a 287 million dollar bank well you can see pretty quickly that the FDIC may go the way of the FSLIC if anybody remembers that uh, that entity now you might quickly say well why didn't they uh, why didn't they go to that TARP money you know they got that TARP money out there they're buying equity in banks and in fact there was a newspaper in Florida that speculated Thursday that the TARP might save Freedom Bank. And then the very next day, Freedom Bank failed. And I think from what my sources tell me, and believe me, I don't have sources inside the FDIC. The FDIC is not a big, uh, necessarily a fan of, of me. And um, for whatever reason, but... Uh, um, what I'm told is that the only banks that can really access the TARP or the new equity money that's being made available by the government are banks that are rated one or two on their CAMEL rating. Now, the, a CAMEL rating is a secret rating all banks get. They can't publicize them. Um, the FDIC doesn't release those figures. But banks that are one or two are fairly good shape. Banks that are three and four are in bad shape. Banks five are on the verge of being closed. So it isn't any three, four, and five banks that are going to be able to access the TARP money. It's what I'm told. It's only banks that are camel one and camel two. 
So what you'll see is relatively healthy banks get money from the government to turn around, probably not to lend the money, but to go ahead and buy out weaker competitors. So you'll just see a consolidation of the banking, uh, banking industry. And unfortunately for Freedom Bank, they probably didn't have any friends either at the government or at Goldman Sachs, evidently. So unfortunately, uh, they are the 17th uh, bank failure of, uh, of the year. I, of course, as, as Lou mentioned, I used to be a banker. Uh, but I was carried out on my shield uh, <laughs> back, in, back in May and uh, had risen fairly high in this bank, little bank in, uh, in Las Vegas, and we were very active in construction lending. In fact, uh, that's what I did for a living, was make construction loans. Um, in fact, some people considered me very good at it. In fact, kind of an idiot savant, if you will, at being able to... <laughs> structure real estate loans. Of course, at the end, they just considered me an idiot <laughs> because they weren't, because it wasn't working out. And it's been mentioned to me by a few people who are here. Um, they've made kind comments about some, some of the articles I've written for Lou about what was going on in Las Vegas. And I would just tell the students in the audience that writing about the market, if you're a banker, is not good for your career path. <laughs> Telling the truth in print really doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you're, if you're working for a bank. Now, it's okay if the market's good. If the market's good, they kind of look by it, and that's okay. But when the Las Vegas economy began to spiral down very quickly in the spring and early summer, um, I remember a particular piece that I wrote about an auction. One of my customers was having some aux uh, an auction of some homes. He had about 50 homes around Las Vegas that he was trying to auction. And he held the auction on, on uh, Derby Day, so it had been the first Saturday in May. And they had this auction, and I stood off to the side, and you had these fancy auctioneers, and they're all wearing tuxes, and they're young guys, and they're energetic, and they're saying, yes, there's a bid and all this, and they're banging gavels and all this stuff. So I thought, from my vantage point, they were actually selling homes. My customer called me up, had me sit next to him at the podium, and he said, this is all fake. These aren't real bids. And as I watched these guys go through this kabuki dance that they were doing, that's exactly what it was. There were actually no bids. And they had 50 houses that they needed to auction. They actually only got live bids on about two or three. And of course, silly me, I decide I, this is pretty good father for an article. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we put it, <laughs> we put it on lewrockwell.com and a few people picked it up and our CFO started getting calls from New York, <laughs> and uh, they said, gee, Doug, you're tanking our stock today. <laughs> I said, well, what tanked it for the previous six months? But uh, anyway, that's what happens at the end. You know, you go from being a, a genius to an idiot and then uh, a scapegoat. And, and ultimately, at the end, I used to be a, a member of the management team that would be on the on the earnings call for the bank, because I was the guy that knew the Las Vegas market. And they would have me spew out all this, this stuff about the Vegas market. Well, when the Vegas market started doing nosedive, I felt compelled to tell the truth. Well, the truth didn't really serve the purposes, and by the first quarter um, earnings call, I was told that I didn't need to participate anymore. So. Uh, such are the things that happen in booms and then in busts. And what I wanted to talk about today is not necessarily recent bubbles, but as uh, Lou mentioned, the title of the speech is, is early bubbles, modern bubbles of paper and, and uh, early bubbles and now uh, the various kind. It could be 
the speech could be called, um, you know, things may change, but they, they always stay the same. I mean, we keep doing these things over and over again. And what's interesting is that I wrote a, a thesis for Murray Rothbard and had that tremendous privilege. But how did I know that I would directly participate in one of the biggest bubbles in the history of the world? But the title of my thesis was actually Early Speculative Bubbles and Increases in the Price of, in the price of Money. And uh, one of the guys that I wanted to talk about today is a very interesting gentleman uh, named John Law. A lot of people haven't heard of John Law, but we, yes, yeah, a John Law fan right up front here. Yeah. Um, and some people view John Law as a, as a genius. Certainly at the time when he was creating money out of nowhere, they thought he was a genius. Of course, later he was considered a man, ma madman and a swindler. And I tend to think that Bernanke is kind of going the same way. That's <laughs> the way this thing's working out. So, so uh, again, the, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But the inter interesting thing about John Law is that he wasn't your uh, old fuddy-duddy economist type. He studied, uh, his, his father was a very sound banker, actually he was a goldsmith banker in Scotland. And uh, John Law learned the banking business from him. John Law was uh, very good with numbers. And uh, so he learned uh, economics. His mother made sure that he got a, a good grounded economics uh, education, both in theoretical and applied economics. So uh, John Law was uh, very well equipped in, in the banking area, very well schooled. And then his father died. His father died in his teens. There's some dispute as to exactly when his father died. But after the, uh, after the death of his father, Law's interest in the, in the banking business kind of waned. And what contributed to that was the fact that he got a little inheritance from, from his father. And he liked, uh, he liked girls. It's the darndest thing. And in spite of the fact that uh, his face was deeply scarred. He had smallpox as a kid. He's a big, strong, strapping guy. And uh, he was very much the ladies' man. In fact, the ladies called him Beau Law. <laughs> Fortunately, the men called him Jesame John. So they weren't quite as impressed with him. But uh, he, uh, he took his father's inheritance and he decided that he wanted to go see the world. So he stopped in London and, and uh, decided to just gamble. And he was a pretty good gambler. He was good enough at math that uh, he had these systems that he was able to, uh, to work and, and made, uh, made good money gambling at night. And, uh, and of course, a fair amount of womanizing in there. He had all the choice of the, the best looking women in, uh, in London. Of course, I don't think we can really say that um, our current uh, monetary cranks are those kind of ladies' men. I'm not sure if Hank Paulson or Bernanke or... Um, I guess Greenspan kind of had his, had his time there. But uh, anyway, uh, Law had a life of leisure for, for nine years, but he got addicted to gambling. So he had to, he had to give it up. And, uh, and about the same time, his love life got in trouble. He, uh, he fell for a, a woman named Elizabeth Villiers. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Ms. Villiers had a jealous suitor named Wilson. But uh, Law was as good with a gun as he, as he was in bed, evidently, because uh, they fought a duel and he shot Wilson on the spot. Now, it's really hard to imagine Alan Greenspan or Bernanke <laughs> in a duel. I mean, now, Hank Paulson, you can, yeah, maybe, I don't know. But uh, anyway, Law was, uh, he was good with a gun, and, uh, and normally this was, uh, those are considered a fair fight, so it uh, wouldn't have been that grave of an offense. But, uh, but Wilson, this Wilson character that he killed had, uh, had some influential friends. So, so Law was uh, put on trial, and he was actually uh, 
sentenced to death. But it, uh, uh, on appeal, it was lowered to a fine, and then he was able to bribe a guard. He was a pretty enterprising guy. And he was able to bribe a guy and the guard and, and escape to the continent. So he actually spent uh, 14 years gambling his way uh, across, across Europe. He couldn't stay in Scotland because he couldn't get a pardon for the murder. Uh, but he gambled his way across uh, Europe. But during the day, he studied banking because he had this, he had this training in, in uh, banking. He was a big fan initially of a very sound bank, um, uh, the Bank of Amsterdam. And the Bank of Amsterdam had, uh, had a, a free coinage policy uh, around the time, uh, early 1600s, of uh, uh, coining any money that was brought to them and had a huge influx uh, in their money supply based on sound money and attracted sound money because they had a, a very good system in place, at least initially. So he was a big fan of that. He studied that. And he also, when he was out at night, he made friends with the Duke of Orleans, amongst many other uh, princes and, and influential people. So uh, John Law not only studied banking, but he, he made uh, influential friends. So John Law attempted to put what he thought was a system in place to, to help the economy. And he first... He first went to Scotland, which was his, his native land, and they were in the Depression, and he said, uh, he went to Parliament, and he said, I know how to fix your problem. And of course, the way to fix the problem is what we've been hearing about all weekend. You need more money. <laughs> and uh, so he thought that the best way to uh, increase the amount of money um, was not the way um, that the Bank of Amsterdam did it. He, had, he, he decided by that time that, uh, that the way the Bank of England, which we heard about earlier in an earlier speech, um, was, a, was a better idea. And so he, he changed his system from, from maybe being fairly soundly based to uh, money that was backed by land. So imagine if, if all of our currency was backed by the, you know, the public lands of the, the United States. Well, that was his idea. And of course, this falls apart rather quickly. Because if you go into the treasury and take your treasury note and, well, give me some of that dirt out here in the garden, this doesn't work very well. And um, so ultimately, uh, John Law had the idea that he wanted unbacked currency, because that's really how... Uh, the Bank of England had paid for England's uh, previous wars, and, and that's really what he thought was uh, uh, the best way to, to revive an economy. It's interesting that Law, even though he uh, advocated a system of fractionalized banking, he wasn't ignorant to its harmful effects. And it's very interesting that, that Yuri had that quote from, from Keynes, where, where Keynes understood that... Uh, that uh, expanding the money supply was essentially a tax on the people, but let's go ahead and do it anyway. Um, John Law was the same way, and this was back in 1705 he wrote this. Raising the money in France is laying a tax on the people, which is soon paid and thought to be paid, or thought to be less felt than a tax laid on, other way, on another way. This tax falls heavily on the poorer sort of the people. So even though he, he advocated for these systems, he was very well aware of, of their uh, very harmful effects. But um, he, was, uh, he was all in favor of that uh, in expanding the money supply in, uh, in just an uh, un unbacked paper. And uh, he was able, um, finally at age 45, after he'd shopped this, monetary system all over Europe. Again, he's, he's gambling at night and he's meeting princes and studying economics. Um, but he finally finds a taker for his system. And uh, it was in 1716 uh, and it was uh, France. Uh, the, his old friend, the Duke of Orleans. 
uh, was able to uh, put him in a position to uh, where he could put his system in place. So this was 1716, and Law was uh, 45 years old at that time. So you might ask, well, why, why would France want this? Well, as we've heard from, from Ron Paul and, and a number of speakers, the reason you need to create more money is to pay for war. And France had been devastated economically. They had uh, fought the War of Spanish Succession. They had piled up huge debts. And Law's plan was to refinance this government debt to lower interest rates and stimulate the languid French economy. Something that we hear day after day after day, if we can just lower these darn interest rates, uh, all will be well. So Law began the Company of the West. He started the, the General Bank. This became the Royal Bank uh, in 1718. And um, then he merged the companies into what was called the Mississippi Company, whose only asset, by the way, was trading privilege with um, Louisiana, essentially. And so for that, um, they, uh, he was able to capitalize that company. So while that company's shares uh, were traded, the Royal Bank increased the money supply. And uh, not only was, uh, did he know that increasing the money supply would, would uh, flow into the price of these shares, the higher the shares go, the more he could refinance the government's debt. And he, uh, he also put people on a payment plan. Very low money down. Low money down, extended terms, kind of a subprime <laughs> way to market stock. So then the, the shares uh, essentially rose tenfold in the case of uh, over the course of two years. And, uh, and ultimately, he tried to support the, the price of the shares with uh, increases in, uh, in the money supply. And uh, unfortunately, in the spring of 1720, the, the system began to unravel. And this led to a series of decrees. Uh, he didn't go down uh, without swinging. Lin legal tender laws. People wanted specie by this point. They wanted silver. They wanted something real for their money. Uh, but he didn't give them that choice. He'd go out and confiscate uh, silver. The government had the power to do that. He put in place legal tender laws. He did all he could do, anti-hoarding laws. Um, maybe that's where FDR got that idea back in the <laughs> early 30s. But Law did all of these things to keep the system uh, alive. But ultimately, the Mississippi shares fell to, um, they fell 86% in a year. And so you had this huge bubble and this huge crash. And you may wonder, well, were these just a few people trading shares that uh, some rich people that lost out? But that's not the case. Uh, the commodities went up in that four-year period, uh, 64%, and real wages for real people uh, went down, uh, went down 19%. And similar to, to today, uh, Law's success was envied. It was envied across the British Channel. Uh, the Bank of England, of course, uh, uh, we know had uh, is very instrumental in. in uh, creation of paper money, but they also wanted a, a vehicle to, um, to refinance that government's debt because they had been involved in wars. And so the South Sea Company was formed by a gentleman by the name of Sir John Blunt, and he was given the uh, monopoly rights to trade with South America. It was the only tangible asset this company had, but they capitalized this company, and for doing that and given that, uh, being given that monopoly, they were, uh, they turned around, refinanced the government's debt, and ultimately refinanced 40 million of it, but that system unwound as well. Ironically, in the South Sea case, the South Sea Company was upset because promoters in Exchange Alley saw the success of the South Sea Company, so they started creating what were known as bubble companies. 
and they were so unhappy about the competition, they were taking money away from their shares that they had the government come in and, uh, and uh, have an anti-bubble act, and it was because of this bubble act that, that uh, eventually unwound uh, the South Sea bubble as well, and those shares fell 80-some um, percent in one year, and, and again, inflicted uh, uh, tremendous pain on, uh, on that economy. So, um, what's going on now is really just a repeat of what we've seen as far back as the early 1700s. I mean, Hank Paulson and his crew from Goldman Sachs may, may think they're doing something new, but uh, they're not. This was known as uh, a lifeboat operation uh, back when Robert uh, Walpole put, uh, put an operation to bail out the banking system in, in England in 1721. Of course, it uh, takes a little more than a lifeboat now. I mean, we've got the We've got the whole fleet employed, trying to uh, trying to keep this uh, trying to keep this thing afloat. In fact, uh, uh, you can just imagine all the captains of these little boats uh, uh, work at Goldman Sachs. It appears, but uh, of course we have the tarp and we have other things. All these acronyms nobody understands. Somebody put it best. They uh, they call it YAP, which is yet another program. So so every day. Of course, my favorite, uh, my favorite term for creating more money out of nothing is, uh, I think I heard this on CNBC the other day, it's called a, a systematic policy response. Now that sounds, that sounds pretty tame. Yeah, it sounds like something you'd go in routine, uh, routine procedure at your doctor's possibly. But uh, uh, that is called creating more money out of uh, nothing to try to bail out the system. But uh, uh, Mises wrote about this, he wrote about this in, uh, a long time ago and explained how this would happen uh, really at the end. He says, if the crisis were ruthlessly permitted to run its course, bringing about the destruction of enterprises which were unable to meet their obligations, then all entrepreneurs, not only banks, but also other businessmen would exhibit more caution in granting and using credit in the future. Instead, public opinion approves of giving assistance in a crisis. Then, no sooner is the worst over than the banks are spurred on to a new expansion of circulation of credit. And that's exactly what we have today. And thus, we live from one speculative bubble to the other. I wish it were different, but the people who can make it different over time are the people in this room and the Mises Institute. Thank you.